Welcome to the Pinpoint Asia podcast. So today we have my friend Abel, who is an accomplished technologist with several years of experience in the DevOps space. Abel has been uh, with many high growth firms such as Zended, uh, Cake Group and uh, Food Panda. He's also uh, a friend uh, who, who I meet often at the park and I've learned quite a lot of things from him in the park and I thought we should present that to a wider audience. He is one of the best technologists I know and uh, also what I like about what he does is that he distills down very hard to understand concepts into something that even I can understand. Yeah, so uh, we'll start off with that. So our aim today is going to try and understand various parts um, about the DevOps world, the cloud world, and in general, how to be a good technologist from Abel. And we also want to ask him about his background. He's been to different countries. He's been, to, he's been in China and Africa, and now he's in Singapore. So I guess we can uh, start off with that. First of all, thank you for joining us today, Abel. And uh, if you can give us a brief intro on, uh, of yourself, please. Yeah, thank you for having me, and uh, it's really a pleasure to talk to you any and every time. And uh, I really appreciate the invite and the thought to have me to have me here, as well as uh, don't put yourself down. You are a pretty smart guy. You understand <laughs> things pretty fast. <laughs> thank you. So, so give us an intro of, of yourself, please. So, I mean, tell us about Africa, China. How got you interested in technology? What keeps you interested in technology? Yeah, so I'm, I'm originally from communist Cuba and uh, I left Cuba in around 2011 and um, have been around those places that you mentioned um, basically working during all, all this time. Um, most of the, of, the, of the work has been in what we nowadays call the ROPS, but I've done whatever I needed to do to survive basically as an economic migrant from from Cuba economic and political both but yeah mainly economic migrant I see okay so what got you interested in technology to begin with uh, the first time I saw a computer I was hooked up already and <laughs> it was the 80s so we are talking I saw a computer communist Cuba from Russia one of those smart keyboards that had visual basic on it or not visual basic, basic on it. And uh, from their head, I was like the next week, I was already reading, luckily, a book about algorithms. And I was already programming in my mind because I didn't have the computer. And uh, since then, it just took off. I actually managed to own my own computer after I graduated from university because of my background and, and uh, well, the conditions I grew up in in Cuba. But... Um, yeah, I, that's that's how it came to be. I have to ask, uh, how did you land on a computer in Cuba? I thought it was very hard to uh, get things like that in Cuba. Yeah, so when when I was a kid, there was no way I could have a computer. Um, just to put you in perspective, when I was around five, my mother bought the first TV that we ever had, and it was it was a black and white Russian TV that for me it was like the event of the year at least at that time but um yeah in those times there was already color tv in the rest of the world and it was like a seamless item that you just have at home uh for me that was a big deal in those times and it was not that we were extremely poor for being in in the place where we lived we were a family that was probably quite well off because my family owned lands, and they all had good jobs, uh, good jobs for Cuban standards. But still, it was hard to get by items. I grew up like in rural Cuba. It wasn't, it wasn't a very glamorous place. Let me put it that way. So, yeah. Okay, so let's now get into the technical stuff, right? Okay, so um, back in the day when uh, when I graduated in two thousand three, right? So there was all this talk about architecture, right? Two-tier architecture, three-tier architecture, right? Mm. Could you describe to us, I mean, how things have evolved in terms of architecture? For example, what is two-tier, what is three-tier? Yeah, so when software started, you just programmed something that did a job. And then um, at some point, people started noticing that that design of the software was not flexible enough. So um, they started trying to divide the logic so that um, you wouldn't have the same uh, the same code doing everything at the same time, meaning 
by dividing it, you can have, for instance, two people working in two different parts of the software, and then they just need to agree on how those two parts talk to each other. And that's how tiers and many other things in software came to be. You needed to grow your software, but to grow the software, you needed to actually logically divide it in a way that it can be worked on in teams or that it can be maintained better by someone who doesn't know the code in the future. Um, that started creating the tiers. We started with two tiers, of course, meaning instead of having one single tier, we will divide that in two logics. Um, they, where they were divided has always been controversial uh, to a certain extent, um, but some people would do it with presentation layer and all the rest um, in another tier. And uh, some people would do it with presentation and logic and then data storage and those kind of things in another tier. But then we invented three tiers and people have gone up to however many tiers you can think of depending on the complexity of the software or their own wishes or uh, uh, their own design ideas. Uh, in some cases, um, people make mistakes by uh, dividing things too much. In some cases, it's a good idea to divide them a bit more. This, the kind of standard of the world up to uh, when microservices came to, to, to the scene was to use at least three tiers, meaning you would have a presentation layer, a business logic layer, and a data processing layer. That's uh, more or less how, how, how it was done for most software. But that doesn't mean uh, it was like 99% of the software, more like a little bit more than half the software tried to follow that, that kind of design. Um, and then it, it evolved over time and has changed. And, and nowadays, um, and probably in the past, it was also the, the best is, is to just use what really works for you and design pragmatically so that your software achieves what it needs to achieve well and, and your team can actually maintain it. I see. So before microservices came into play, the three tiers were defined as one presentation layer, which is the UX UI, right? And then um, you have a business logic layer, yeah. and then the data layer, yeah. right? Which is the, essentially where the data is stored, right? Yeah, so, exactly. so how did microservices, what, what is microservices and how did it change all of this? Yeah, so microservices, uh, we, we in IT coin terms for things that have existed for a long time, but you need a marketing word or a word that actually allow, allows you to think and divide it in in, um, in a specific category so that you can separate it. That's, uh, that applies to most fields of, of knowledge, but in IT, we are very particular about it. And especially the companies that start using these kind of things like to, to create their own catchy term. Uh, and like that, we have the cloud, DevOps, and all of those uh, things are terms that are kind of made up like most things in the latest 20 years or whatever. So um, uh, microservices came to be somewhat like that. Um, and um, essentially what it means is you divide your, your service into a minimal scope service that it can serve uh, some specific objective you have. And if you need other services to support it, unless it's within the same logic of that service, you put it in a separate microservice. Um, that design is good and bad depending on the situation you are in. Uh, like for instance, sometimes you need speed and, and for speed and one single developer probably the best is to just do a monolith that creates your web application and you ship it right away. And then as it becomes popular, you start dividing some of that logic into smaller chunks and, and make it more microservice-like. That's a common practice and tends to be good for many startups and, and small companies because when you have an idea and you just want to get it to market, you, you need to move fast. And then microservices... Um, they, they help you a lot in those stages as a startup when, when 
when you start facing issues. Like, for instance, I have a bottleneck in this particular component of, of my monolith. Let me divide it out into its own microservice, and that will, will handle the, the load because that microservice then can scale uh, independently from the monolith. Um, like that is how, uh, in most startups, microservices come to be. Bigger companies uh, tend to like microservices a lot because that means that one team or a small group of people could maintain a few microservices. And like that, you can have a thousand microservices, and those microservices work independently from each other, plus the teams also work independently from each other. They just need to coordinate in how we will send messages to each other when we need to. Like, for instance, when you are doing a payment, you need to process the payment itself as a transaction, but you might also have to record statistics or um, update some storage uh, system that you have for whatever item the person is buying or things like that. Um, big companies tend to uh, really like to have those in microservices. They can backfire uh, sometimes, like, for instance, in the last few years we heard about AWS rolling back some of the microservices designs they have in-house for some of their services. Uh, like um, um, the uh, Prime, AWS uh, Prime video services or something like that. Um, I can pull the article from internet and send it to you later. Can, can we dumb it down one more level uh, down, right? So, so basically, what is a monolith application? Right. What's an example of a monolith application? And at what stage would someone need to graduate from a monolith, monolithic application to an application that has to use microservices? What, what's a use case for this? Yeah, so um, monolith is what we would design normally in the past. And it would mean it's an application that self-contains everything it needs to run. That includes... Uh, if you use, for instance, three layers, you would have the presentation there. You will have the business logic there. And you will have the database there. And whatever new logic or service you need to put into that, you will uh, also put it inside that. Meaning, for instance, going back to the payments example that I was, I was telling you, um, you will have a, a layer where people introduce their payment information, like a credit card or, or whatever it is. Then there is a business layer that would process that. And then that, the outcome of whatever the operation is, like it was rejected or it was accepted, would be stored in, in the database once the logic is processed. So all of that would be your, your monolith, but then it would grow over time because you will need a web shop and you'll put it there. You will need statistics about how the users behave. You'll put it there. You will need more um, logic and then it would end up in the same application. That's what we call a monolith. Um, and then microservices would be uh, the case when uh, that logic is divided. For instance, the simplest one would be you have a front end and then you have an API for back end. And then when the user goes to the front end, they introduce their credit card information over there in the front end. And then that front end talks to the back end to, um, to process the, the payments and, and so on. So that would be... A, simple way to divide it. But probably the back end you might divide it in, in various microservices. One processes statistics and one processes uh, the payments themselves. And then um, yeah, each of them would have their own self-contained way of, of um, working, meaning as in the logic will be complete for that microservice. That's what microservices uh, try to aim at. Meaning uh, if you have a payment system, it will self-contain its own database with whatever else it needs for the for the system to work. But in some cases, people also divide that. It depends on what your your needs are. Does it mean that microservices essentially is a bunch of APIs? Is that what it means? So, like, whenever someone calls a um, microservice, then it yeah. If you go to the concept of 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 API, you could define any microservices as, as an API because uh, basically it's an interface for something to do something. Um, but um, there are not only APIs as microservices. You could have, uh, or what we classically call an API as a microservice. You could have something that 
essentially just takes information and processes batches from no user, no um, no um, direct interfacing with with other systems except for just pulling information from a database. You could have that. Um, it's hard to call that an API, but <laughs> people can stretch the terms. So uh, yeah, it, it, it could be an API, but API is a term that refers to um, a system that has an interface for other systems to talk to them. Um, and uh, in this case, microservices um, could be more than that or could be something different from that. So what are the so the obvious advantage is that if you don't have microservices, then the monolithic application gets too clunky, right? So you have to make sure that you break it down so that it's not too clunky. And yeah. Yes, that's one of the main points of why people use microservices. But if you are designing something new, maybe it will never get, get clunky because it will never be popular or it will never be a business viable thing and you just want to test it. And uh, then maybe the monolith is better for you because you put a framework there that is complete and has everything you need. I don't know, if you use Python, for instance, Django is one of the more popular ones. Or if you use, I don't know, PHP, um, you could use a CMS like WordPress or a framework like Symfony or one of the, the newer ones. Uh, Symfony is like the grandpa of PHP uh, frameworks. And... Um, yeah, depending on your on your needs, you you might want to start with a monolithic application to speed up the process of shipping something. What about on the security front? Does does, does it help to have uh, the application cut into different bits or? Uh, not directly, but it it can depending on the size of your team, depending on the size of your network, depending on how things will talk to each other. Um, when you have microservices, if they just talk to each other on plain text and someone can get in the middle, then they can read your information. But that means they have access to your network. That means, uh, yeah, you have already uh, lost some security on the process. So the monolithic application, everything is within the application. Maybe someone can inject SQL or something and, and hack it or something like that. But everything is self-contained within the same the same application. So, from some um, points of view, you could argue that the monolithic application might be more secure than the than the microservices. But there are ways to go around uh, the security of how the microservices talk to each other. Like, for instance, you can use uh, different ways of uh, authentication for one service to talk to each other, and um, in the monolithic application, then you have the, the problem of the surface area might be very big to secure, and there might be people trying to secure it without really understanding fully what they are securing. And in the case of the microservices, um, you could argue that people have less things to be worried about themselves. But the problem then comes as in when you are a big company and you have 350 microservices, um, how do you make sure that everyone secures things the right way? And yeah, it, it's a very complicated subject. Security in 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 IT in general is is a, it's a hairy subject. Well, okay, All right now let's um, move to the subject of um, uh, DevOps, right? So could you? I mean, first of all, what is this DevOps? What were they doing before DevOps was in practice? Why does someone need DevOps? Yeah, so. Um, like many things in the world, um, Americans invent terms and we follow through. <laughs> um, yeah, Silicon Valley started, adopted this term or invented it and then we've run with it. Um, and what it, what it tried to convey is before most companies had a development team and then a team that would run the operations part. Sysadmins, network admins, or whatever they 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 were called uh, before, and then um, the, 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 the developers would develop their software and then just put it in the hands of the operations team and say, yeah, it's your problem now. <laughs> and then the operations team would have to try to run that, and then there would be the back and forth where uh, not we are the same team, but the back and forth was... Um, yeah, we are 
different teams and, and, and there was communication issues. So what it tried to do was bridge that, that gap of communication between developers and, and operations people. So the DevOps term was, was born. Um, before that, I was working as developer and as sysadmin in, in some cases and network engineer in some cases. And um, yeah, when the, tem- the term came, uh, became something, I, I adopted it right away because it kind of described me better because I couldn't, I couldn't fit as a developer and I couldn't fit as a sysadmin and I couldn't fit as a network engineer. I'm not good enough to be any of them. But if you, you could argue also that a developer couldn't be as good enough as me to maintain operations of something and, and a network engineer wouldn't understand development as someone who dedicates to, to what I do. Uh, so um, it kind of um, created a generalist field that uh, forces you to become decent in 150 technologies and and not really good at any of them, but um, yeah, it, it's it, it's a it's a different, uh, very different field from from being a developer, for instance. Yeah. So I'm trying to understand, right, why someone would need um, uh, DevOps people, right? For example, say say there is a complicated application, like uh, like say I don't know, like Microsoft Word, you know, mm. and then so you have a developer who who essentially writes the code for Microsoft Word in, I don't know, maybe Visual C++ or whatever, you know. Yeah. And then um, he deploys, some guy in the company deploys it, right? Yeah. And th- those are the operations guys who deploy it? So, or... So, yeah. applications like the actual application of Microsoft that runs in a machine, like, I don't know, your tablet or your laptop, um, that application, it's, um, it's normally maintained by the IT people, what they call IT department, which is also somewhat separate from, from DevOps in most organizations. Every organization has their own concept of what DevOps is. In some cases, DevOps and IT are the same thing. They maintain similar things. Uh, in some cases, they are separate. Um, for instance, some organizations would have an IT department which uh, deals directly with uh, the laptops and the devices and those kind of things. And then the DevOps team would, would maintain the applications they need to run on servers. Meaning, for instance, if you need a software that will deploy the installation of Word and whatever else you need in the in the computer into the different technicians or people who work in the company, then the people who maintain that software might be what they call the pops. In some cases, they are just the IT team, but um, yeah. Or uh, let's go a step uh Upwards, Microsoft de- uh, developed the web uh, version of, of um, Word, and that's a system that you need to run on a server in the cloud or something like that. Then um, normally it would be the DevOps people who, who would maintain that. In some cases, it's also the IT people who maintain it. Um, the typical case of what DevOps does is when you have an enterprise system and that enterprise system needs to be um, uh, maintained so that it serves customers and the developers um, can actually continue delivering software upgrades and then someone handles the part of um, how to operate the system over time and, and, and be the bridge between um, development and having the system up. But like that, we have continued creating terms like SRE, and platform engineering as of late. So um, things continue evolving. Uh, and, and the field itself is, there are concepts, definitions for all of those terms, but in practical terms, they are really hard to pinpoint depending on the company where, where you work or, or that you are talking to. So, for instance, from the point of view of a recruitment firm, firm, it would be um, wise to understand what they mean by DevOps in X company that you are hiring a role for. I see. Because um, the roles might vary a lot. The job descriptions kind of say quite a bit, but um, 
in some cases, they are very generic and they don't really have uh, a lot of specifics. So it's good to get detailed job description, descriptions. Um, yeah. Um, oh, I see. So, the, so essentially, uh, generally, right, um, DevOps would be, the DevOps guys are the ones who support the application after the developers have um, installed it. Yeah? So they have to make sure the application is running properly. Uh, that's one of the main roles of, of DevOps people, but um, we also tend to have a lot of experience on what works, what doesn't. Meaning, if there is a system that has a significant amount of load, um, developers like elegant solutions. In many cases, we like solutions that work. <laughs> yeah, And uh, hopefully, those two can be can get together, but for instance, you give me a system like a system diagram and I know the bottlenecks right away from seeing the diagram in most cases. Like, yeah, you just have to tell me, uh, we put load on this and we have a problem, high CPU in X place. And, and probably I can tell you the design uh, things that you would need to change without asking you too many questions. Why? Because I have seen a thousand systems that, that have had issues and where the issues come from. Um, and that's uh, probably something that developers only see when their system becomes very popular and it's some particular experience they oh, had once or twice um, in that regard. So, yeah, I'm not a very good architect, but I, I can architect systems for them to perform to the uh, to certain extent, and yeah, it, it's our field is very generalist, and architecture and helping with architecting things is just one of the areas aside what 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 you mentioned. But there are there are other areas like security. We as DevOps need to understand security um, pretty well, otherwise systems get hacked. Um, we need to understand performance of, um, depending on what your company does, but performance of databases very well. Otherwise, databases don't perform. And be able to tell the developers when, for instance, you have a database and there are 10 queries, but this is the one you need to fix because it's the one causing performance issue. We need to understand monitoring systems very well. We need to understand pipelining systems. And it's not like we are plumbers. It's, it's about... Um, how we deliver the code to production, we call that production or other systems is what we call pipelines. That means how you build your application, compiling, uh, testing the code and those kind of things. Um, so there are many fields where there are many technologies for that you need to be somewhat versed to be in, in DevOps. I see. So you alluded to other terms and how different companies use those definitions differently, right? But in your definition, what's the difference between, say, SRE and platform engineering and DevOps? Yeah, let me start from the end. Platform engineering is basically about creating platforms for developers to use, meaning kind of like the old concept of walled gardens where people can play around, but there are certain limits. Um, that's most of the work of what platform engineers do. They develop software for in-house use. And this applies normally to big companies, big enterprise environments. Um, some smaller companies have their platform engineering. And there are many SaaS providers of parts or complete solutions for, for platform engineering. Um, and uh, depending on, on the case and your situation, you might want... Um, one or the other, meaning um, certain in-house people doing certain part of your platforms and sometimes use some of those SaaS services. Uh, SaaS, PaaS, LAS, depending on, on, on the case, there are, there are many different modalities of, of business in this area. And then um, that would be what platform engineers do nowadays. Um, SRE is an older term, so platform engineering kind of absorbed part of what SREs would be doing. But again, companies have different practices and um, basically what 
means Cesare in one company might not be. Aside from that, there are uh, documentations of the people in Google when they created um, Cesare Cesare and all that with definitions of what those terms are. They are readily available in the internet, so um, we don't really need to talk about them. But then uh, the site reliability engineer, it's basically for most companies the person who um, keeps things running, uh, deals with events that happen, like emergencies, and liaisons between um, a group of developers, um, a group of people who maintain different platforms for those developers, and coordinate um, reliability events, um, things like that. That's what from my practical point of view, most companies uh, call an SRE, yeah? In some cases, they go um, into other areas as well. Like, in some cases, SRE is indistinguishable from what DevOps is. And then um, the older term of the three is, is DevOps, which is, which originally engulfed all of it, um, SRE, um, platform engineering, and DevOps, because those terms didn't exist. And it's all of the areas that I was talking about, like combining the operations with the security, with the um, interfacing with uh, development, with um, yeah, many other different general areas. The, 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 sorry, you have the site and reliability, right? Yeah. The site mean essentially the entire ecosystem. Of, what, is, what is site? It can mean many things. It can be you are responsible for the reliability of a specific data center. It can be the whole cloud enterprise of your company. It can be uh, a hybrid system with cloud and, and, and on-site data center kind of thing. Or yeah, it, it, it varies a lot from company to, to company as well. Yeah. I see. So, I mean, having been in this field for a while, right? When you look for DevOps candidates, right? I mean, how do you know whether someone is a good DevOps person or a not so good DevOps person in terms of their skill set? How, how, how can you tell the difference? Um, yeah. Well, you need to understand a few, a few things about concepts and, and, and technology and, and, and issues about, about the field. Um, but it's it's hard to define when a DevOps person is is good without actually testing it or having him do some work. Or um, but um, number one, you need to have a character that is willing to learn because in DevOps, every time you you move to a new job, there will be a few dozens of of software that will be new to you and that you have to learn. In the best cases, you'll have like a background on something similar. Like for instance, talking about pipelines. Every company has their own way of delivering software to production. Um, and that implies a solution that in some cases might be one software, in other cases will be other. And there are hundreds of software out there. Some paid, some uh, software as a service, uh, some you maintain it yourself. It depends on the case. So given that there will be so much heterogeneity in the, in the, in the software field that, that maintains pipelines, um, you need to know how they work in general. You need to understand a few of them very well. And aside from that, you need to be willing to learn. And the other part is what is the expectation of the person who is hiring? Maybe the person who is hiring has a Jenkins. Jenkins is, is one of the softwares for, for doing this, which is one of the oldest open source solutions. Um, it's also one of the hardest ones to, to deal with and maintain. It's made in Java. It's it's established solution for this. Um, so maybe that person needs for this person who's going to be hired to solve a specific problem that they already have. And it's a complicated problem that his people in-house cannot solve. So when you hire that person, he needs to be really good at that. 
it, it cannot be someone who has worked with other solutions and has never seen this because he will not know more than the people have, who have been working for years with, with this kind of software. So it also depends a lot on the, on the situation at the, at the time of hiring. And um, um, you, as, as a person hiring, you need to understand, number one, is this person willing to learn? Number two, what is it that my customer, the, the, the ultimate uh, person who is going to, to employ the services of, of this person, really needs? Uh, once you understand those, you, uh, you need to understand the few concepts and how things work in the field of DevOps. And the more you know about the, the specific tech, the better. But you don't have to be an expert. And you have to have a few questions that you should know that someone for this kind of job needs to know the answer for. That's, uh, that's a good start. And then maybe... He, the person will still not be not be very good, but you will at least know what what's going on in general and get a feel of of how they work and so on. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. How do you think DevOps is going to evolve in the future? Well, it's hard to predict because uh, new things come all the time. Um, the The advent of AI is already affecting the many fields. One of them is for sure going to be DevOps at some point. Um, in my day-to-day -day work, I use many of these tools already. Like, I'm a generalist. I, I can program, and I, I can program in probably five or six different programming languages, but I don't remember the syntax of any of them in any given day because, number one, I don't use them every day, and uh, number two... Um, it, it's not really my job to, to be an expert in five programming languages. But it's my job when I have a problem that needs to be solved in a programming language to be able to solve it. So um, I, I really benefit from new tools like OpenAI, ChatGPT, and, and similar tools because I don't need to know the syntax of, of um, let's say, Golang is a language that I've been using recently a lot. Um, I don't really need to know all the syntaxes of everything. I need to know the programming theory to a certain extent, and I need to know the basics of the language. And then I'm writing a for loop, which is one of the simplest things you can do in, in programming. And um, if I don't really remember the syntax, I just tell ChatGPT, yeah, I'm writing a for loop for this. Can you please write it for me? And it does it. And the for loop is something that I'll probably remember because I... I program regularly, but if then I go back, I have to go back to program something in, in, let's say, PHP or Bash, maybe I don't remember that same structure for how to do it. You just go and ask the question and you'll get the answer right away. You don't have to go into a bunch of websites to find the Stack Overflow answer that then you need to test, and then it carries some baggage with it because it's not exactly the question you asked. Um, yeah, and I put the example of a for loop, but... Um, in real life, it's much more complicated than that, than just the for loop. Do you think AI can replace the need for DevOps people, or is it going to be more like a tool that DevOps people can use? Well, I'm guessing it depends on the, on the time frame we, we are talking about. Um, for now, it, it's not. Um, for now, um, AI will, will still need to improve on many things, like, for instance... Um, one of the fields that is hot now in AI is to try to um, use context for things. And when I mean context, I mean history and, and I mean understanding on how the company evolved over time and understanding how the systems evolved over time. Um, a DevOps engineer, once he has been for a year or two with a company, he has a, a hard grasp on those things. A prompt chat cannot do that. Uh, if that prompt chat has been with you for, let's say, five years, maybe, or it has your history for five years, like access to your tickets and all of that, maybe it can grasp some of it. Um, but it, it, it's hard to, to, to actually go further than, because most of the, of the 
new AI systems. They, they process things based on uh, prompts. Yeah. And the problem with that is you need to actually design something which is, uh, there are a bunch of companies working on designing something that actually can take a problem and design a project around it. That's a lot harder than, than just give me a function to do a specific task. Doing that, AI is pretty good depending on how complicated that, that uh, prompt could be. Um, like for instance, if you give it classic problems like how do I sort a, a list of things, those kind of things is, is very good at. But when you give it a problem that implies sorting plus 20 other things at the same time, number one, the description of the problem from the human will, will never be that good. Number two, it, it will inevitably, as of today, uh, skip parts of the answers and, and omit things and not infer things that humans would, would automatically assume as true. And, and the answer normally tends to be useless to have, a, <laughs> to have some term to, to call it. But um, yeah, at least incomplete answers. And, and, and that of getting a problem or help you define a problem, and then once it helps you define the problem, run with it and create a project around it and develop the software on its own and deploy it. That's quite far still, yeah? But there are already attempts to work on that. There are a few startups in Silicon Valley and in other places working on it. So, yeah, um, they will try. Um, I see it really hard as of today. Um, but, yeah, it, it's work in progress. It will take a few years still. And when I say a few years, it might be anywhere between 5 and 17. <laughs> <laughs> Before we move away from DevOps, right, one more question. Sometimes we see on job descriptions, right, that um, DevOps can fall under application or sometimes it can fall under infrastructure, right? Yeah. I mean, where does it, I mean, is there a, is there a I mean, from, what, from what I'm understanding, from what you've described, is that it's pretty general, it involves both application and infrastructure, right? So why the reason, reason for the split and... Uh, uh, is, is, there, is there any justification to splitting it into two different um, uh, parts like that? In, in many cases, it's just politics in the companies and how they decided to organize themselves 25 years ago, and then now it is what it is. Um, in, in other cases, it's about the actual job the person will be doing. Because um, there are companies where DevOps maintains both the infrastructure and the application side of uh, the operation side of, of, um, of things. And there are companies where they have two separate teams, one for maintaining the ops of infrastructure side of things and one to maintain the applications operations themselves. Uh, in some cases, the companies just decide to call the people who work in the infrastructure side DevOps and the people who work in the application side SRE. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's up to the companies and how they understand these fields and, and how they do it. Um, in, in particular, um, when you find a, a JD that says uh, it's about the application side of things, the best is to understand because it might mean that it's both. Or it might mean that they will work within a developer team and, uh, and be part of the team of developers to deploy a specific application. Yeah? That's another divide that some companies have the DevOps team as a separate team, and some companies have the DevOps people within the teams themselves. Meaning there will be 10 DevOps people, each of them will be working on their one application that does X thing, and he's responsible for the operations of that application and that alone. And they might get together all the DevOps people to coordinate some things, but it's not, it, it's not like they work on their DevOps manager doing the DevOps work. And then other companies go for the route of, we will have a DevOps team that is independent of 
each of the developer teams, and there will be 50 developer teams that actually um, interface with this, this DevOps team to, to deploy and, and so on. The one with the separate manager is more like the old school way of, of doing things, but it's what most companies still do. Um, meaning the old school as in when you had a sysadmin that actually uh, would get some dump of software from the, from the developers and would have to put it to work. Um, but then when you put the developer, the, the DevOps people to, to in the, dev, uh, the developer team, it, it has certain benefits and certain drawbacks as well. Like for instance, when you have a DevOps team, you can dedicate people to platform engineering, for instance. But if they are within a developer team, they will answer to the needs of those developers and not the broader needs of the organization itself. Some organizations have both, have a team that does platform engineering, both or more. Um, platform engineering, then they have a DevOps guy that manages the operations for certain group of applications and another DevOps guy manages the, the needs of certain groups of applications or more than one and then they might have SRE to manage monitoring incidents um, those kind of things and yeah and the names I'm just calling them something based on the logic of what I have seen in the industry but not that it has to be one way or another yeah got it now moving to the subject of clouds right so back in the day, we had servers like a Windows Server or et cetera, et cetera, on premises, right? On, and then later on, um, they moved everything to the cloud and data center, everyone can share, virtualization, et cetera, et cetera, right? Hmm. Could you give us a one-on-one on like, um, say, AWS versus Google Cloud versus Azure, right? When does it make sense to use what cloud? And uh, is it mainly dependent on um, the manager's preference or is, is there a particular difference between the, these clouds? And the second one is, Kubernetes and, and uh, uh, containers, what, what are all those things and how, what's, uh, what, what's the division? All right, uh, there's a lot to unpack in there. <laughs> uh, so um, the cloud, the first cloud provider was arguably AWS and that's why they became so big. Um, the promise of the cloud was we will handle a big deal of the infrastructure, uh, heavyweight, uh, parts and and we will make it cheaper than than maintaining your own service in house with your own networking in house with your own team for all of those things uh, in house plus the application side of things and and all of that so um, because of that it it became really popular meaning you just need to spin a server and you are serving your you just installed a couple of things and you are serving your application with no need to plan ahead for three months to buy your hardware to actually deploy your your application and then maintain it and then uh, having to have um, a site reliability for backups and and all of that uh, it it's costly it's hard to plan and then you need a lot of additional knowledge in-house. Like you need people who understand networking. You need people who understand cabling or hire a company who can do it well. You need people who then understand the operations of hardware uh, like servers and those kind of things. You need people who, who, who can then deploy the software into those, into those servers, meaning operating systems, uh, security patches, all of those things. And aside, you need the knowledge about the applications and those kind of things. What the cloud came to do was solve many of those problems. And that's why it became popular. Because it allowed companies to focus more on what their uh, business objectives were and worry somewhat less about the, about the maintenance of some things that are not remotely related to what their business is. For instance, when you sign up for AWS or any other of the major clouds, um, they handle most of the networking for you. Networking um, 
can be complicated to maintain for businesses. Why? Because you need very specialized people who understand how a Cisco router works or how a, I don't know, F5 load balancer works. And, and that requires very specific knowledge that, yeah, you, you can't do without when you have in-house hardware if your system is busy and important and all of that. And then, like that, you would need a, a group of other knowledges that, that you might find scarce to find. Uh, it's expensive to maintain, like you need to pay salaries and all of that. And then in AWS, you can do uh, the network with a few clicks and you need to learn some, uh, you, you need to learn how some basic things of networking are, but your knowledge doesn't need to be so deep about um, the actual hardware and the actual software provider. And they abstract many things from, from you, from having to do, yeah? Um, and that, that's a huge advantage for businesses because only not having to pay those salaries plus maintaining all of that uh, infrastructure plus making it reliable, which is another big deal, it, it's important. Uh, aside from that, if you are in a, in a field where you need certifications of things, uh, they will do most of the, of the getting certified for you, meaning the cloud providers, for many of those things, except for the things that you have to maintain yourself. Like, for instance, if you run servers, um, the network and all of that, it's, you just need to make sure that you have some basic security knowledge and they will maintain most of the things for you. Basic security knowledge, basic networking uh, knowledge. And then if there is a problem, they will help fix the problem with the network. Um, you can get support from them. Um, in some cases paid depending on the, on the provider and in some cases not. And then you will need to have the people who can actually maintain the operating systems of your virtual machines and deploy the software that you need deployed in, in in-house, plus how the software is going to be shipped there. And then the cloud kept evolving, and uh, we have things like Lambda, where the developer just deploys code, and there is no server to be maintained, for instance, which is a big advantage. Or things like RDS, which is uh, relational databases from AWS. And then they, they allow for... Uh, uh, management of databases to not have to involve maintaining the base operating system and maintaining the database system itself, but only some parts of the configuration and the work, manage the workload itself uh, within the house, which means you reduce about half of the heavy listing, lifting of, of managing a database. Um, of course, each thing has drawbacks. Like, for instance, if you can maintain the operating system, you can optimize it if you know what you're doing better than, than in many cases, what AWS does. But the issue is um, AWS optimizes it pretty well. And then that's good enough for most businesses. And, and that applies to almost everything. And then Kubernetes as a service was um, another of the services that came with the, with the cloud. Uh, Kubernetes is it's a Google uh, product. They released it as open source. Um, they used something uh, they called the Borg before in-house. And um, uh, they released it around, um, it's going to be ten, 10 years ago or something like that. As, the, f the first version of Kubernetes. And um, it, it has taken the enterprise world by storm because it also um, allows for enterprises to, to abstract themselves from many of the heavy li lifting of maintaining servers. Meaning, if you launch an EKS, EKS is the, the managed... Um, service of Kubernetes from AWS, Elastic Kubernetes Service. If you launch an EKS cluster, um, you can configure it for it to auto-scale 
whenever more servers are needed. And then you don't have to pay for the servers when they are not needed anymore. Uh, you can configure your application to scale on its own horizontally, meaning uh, normally you need two uh, containers. We'll explain containers later. Assume a container is uh, an independent instance of an application. So assume you run your application normally with two containers, and then there is load suddenly, and you, instead of two, need 200. Uh, Kubernetes has inbuilt tools to actually help you manage that and scale your application um, horizontally. That's what is called horizontally. Uh, vertically would be to increase the size of those containers. So you would maintain the two containers and ver vertically make them bigger so they can handle more load. Um, there, there are both modalities of scaling. The more common one is horizontal because uh, it, it tends to be simpler than, than vertical. Vertical has its own problems, but it's too deep into, into the field. So um, then Kubernetes came to solve uh, problems like that. How do I scale? How do I uh, maintain the server's operating system? That's something that normally you wouldn't do if you have a Kubernetes cluster because AWS will provide you with an image that is optimized to run Kubernetes and is optimized to run workloads on it. And, and you don't have to worry about maintaining the base of the, the operating system itself. And the machines will come and go. You basically forget that, that um, you have to maintain the OS itself. Um, and then like that, it, it brought a lot of advantages, especially for, for big enterprises. Um, the promise of the cloud that seems has not been fulfilled is about cost. Um, cost is, is a big deal for, for many companies nowadays, and or it has always been, but the cloud promised to be cheaper, and it doesn't seem to have delivered that. And that's why many companies in, in today's world are opting out of the cloud in some cases, or some hybrid kind of environment where they can decide what will go to the cloud and what won't. What's cheap will serve it in the cloud. What we really need to serve in the cloud will serve it in the cloud. Whatever will be too expensive, we will decide to serve it in-house in our own data center, so similar. Or in some cases, we have systems that for regulatory issues cannot go into the cloud, and then those will host them in-house and the rest will host them in the cloud. So it, there are many possible decisions that, that need to be made based on your situation, uh, the company situation. But yeah, that, that's more or less the gist of it. Um, and the, the side of Kubernetes taking the world by storm, I, I got into it pretty early uh, and I, I've never seen an adoption of a somewhat complicated technology so fast in, in this in this field, it's uh, it moved really fast, and in 2015, most places were talking about Kubernetes, and by 2018, like half of the enterprise was already somewhat using some Kubernetes. So it it it's a good technology. I mean, if we base it on that, it's a good technology because, it, and it's not only about fashion. Some people say. <laughs> Uh, we adopt new technologies because of fashion, but um, in this case, it actually brings many advantages. I I have I have friends who are who don't like it. I have friends who like it, but most of the friends who don't like it is because they haven't really used it that much. When 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 you know someone in 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 this field who has not used Kubernetes those tend to be the people who normally tend to not like it. And it's because it solves many, many problems that the DevOps world had. Like scaling is a major one. You could scale before, but you had to maintain operating system and you had to maintain many more things. Kubernetes helps you with that. And, and it's arguably over-engineered probably for some uh, use cases, but it's, it's, it's a technology that has somewhat revolutionized the enterprise world. Oh, I see. 
oh that's okay that was great so what i want to do right is um i'm trying to understand what you're saying uh what you said but i want to throw a practical example let's mm-hmm. let's say i'm a I manufacture t-shirts, right? And I'm selling t-shirts online, yeah? Mm-hmm. I'm, 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 I'm the IT guy in the, in the company mm-hmm. and uh, there is a server and uh, basically there's a web application and then uh, people come and buy my t-shirt and then I sell them. Right? Essentially that, it's a small web application, right? Yep. Now, all of a sudden, the t-shirt is um, getting uh, very popular and now... Uh, You went viral on internet with uh, something. Yeah, all of a sudden there are like 100,000 people yeah. going in every hour or whatever, right? Yeah. So my question is, where does the networking come into play to begin with? Like, for example, why would, yeah. say, say I'm the IT guy in the company, right? Yeah. Why would I need to know about networking, about all that, you know? Yeah. yeah. So if you have all that in-house, let's say you rent an office and you have a small server room where you host your servers for this application, probably you have one or two servers because you have... 300, 400 purchases a, a day, and uh, you rent, let's say, a bandwidth of, I don't know, 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, you name it. Uh, you rent that from, from an ISP. Uh, you rent your bandwidth, your IPs from someone. You need to buy your, your uh, physical IP addresses from, from someone. And then... Um, You set up a networking that works for you, some Cisco router. Maybe you need a load balancer if you have two servers. Um, and then your setup works, and maybe it will work for 100x your current load. You have tested it, you are confident. But what if tomorrow it becomes a 1,000x? There is where the problems start, because normally you can't move fast enough to acquire all the hardware you would need for... Um, serving all that traffic at, at once if it, if it starts coming especially suddenly. And the other part is, once the customers go away, what did you buy the hardware for? Yeah, so um, because in, in some businesses they are seasonal or they have very high load during the morning or during the day and then at night they have zero load. So you are essentially maintaining those systems in-house for the same cost all over time. Issues like this is what the cloud and Kubernetes aim at solving. Uh, like for instance, in AWS, you could run auto-scaling with Kubernetes or without for your systems to be on two servers all day long when you have like the 100 customers. And I'm saying two servers so that if one goes down, the other one can assume the load. So it will run in your two servers all day long. And when there is load on, on those servers, then you scale them. You add one more and one more and one more and one more and so on to cover the thousand X. Yeah. Of course, all of this needs to be tested, fine tuned and make sure it works for you. But those are the things that the cloud came to solve because you don't need to plan that much ahead for scaling and resilience and growth in the cloud. Uh, you can make plans for what's going to happen in the next, I don't know, two days, and pretty much the rest solves itself, unless it's like strategic decisions of your business and your needs to run your IT uh, needs. Yeah? Uh, I see. One other question I have is, so, so The part about the cloud, I understand, yes? So essentially, you can configure it to scale up big time, right, automatically. How does Kubernetes help that again? So cloud by itself, doesn't it automatically scale up? And if you configure it that way from AWS? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, I, when you start with servers in the cloud, let's say you are already in the cloud, um, AWS has something called auto-scaling groups, and you can configure it for your servers to be created if, for instance, the CPU of the server starts getting used or the memory or different parameters. You can configure your auto-scaling groups to add more machines to it. If you have Lambda functions, for instance, it's another service of AWS, you can make those Lambda functions scale automatically. You don't, you don't even know there is a server behind or 20 or 25. Um, that's, um, those are things that those two have the capability of doing. Then Kubernetes, what it does is it gives you what Lambda can do, but puts a lot of control in the enterprise side of things because Lambda behaves 
uh, aside from a few parameters that you can tweak, it behaves the way AWS designed it to do. But when you have Kubernetes, you can control a lot more things, uh, like how the security is for the, the cluster itself, how the scaling is for the whole cluster, but be specific on applications, meaning um, you have auto-scaling groups that scale your machines and you scale them the way you want those machines instead of just letting AWS handle that in the case of Lambda. Or you could scale, it, scale the machines the way you want in uh, auto-scaling groups, but then if you are running 300 applications, that becomes a problem because then you need to have 300 auto-scaling groups or something similar. In Kubernetes, you can have a few auto-scaling groups and then the cluster will scale when Kubernetes doesn't have capacity to, to process or when it's getting close to, to, to not having capacity. That's the way you scale the cluster itself. And then the applications will scale independently of the cluster whenever the application needs to scale. So you have 300 applications, two of them receive load now, those two will start adding pods, and then that will cause the cluster to notice that it doesn't have enough or it won't have enough load if the applications keep scaling. So I'll add a few nodes more. And then it can have logic for what type of nodes need to be added. Basically, you can decide, now I need GPU because this application uses graphics or AI or whatever it is that, that needs GPU. Or now I will use what they call in AWS spot instances, which is instances that are like additional um, uh, machines that are not being used at this time and AWS provides them at a cheaper price, but they can claim, it, claim them at some point. So based on your workload, you can decide, I want to run on spots or I want to run on what they call on demand, which is like normal use or savings plans, which is when you have a deal with AWS to save some money out of it, and those kind of things. All of those things, Kubernetes can have logic to define where it needs to scale to. So some applications cannot run on spot because they take long time to shut down. In that case, you could put logic in Kubernetes to actually decide based on what it needs to scale for, what type of nodes is going to to add to your, to your load, and many more things like that, yeah. I see, I see, yeah. Cluster meaning all the compu computers yeah, together. when you deploy Kubernetes, you deploy it in a cluster. That normally means a few master nodes. Master nodes is like the brain of Kubernetes. Uh, see, yeah. The brain of Kubernetes has the scheduler. Scheduler is just the thing that decides where your workload is going to actually run. And then um, it has a few... It, they also call it the control plane. Yeah, it controls how the, the Kubernetes cluster behaves. It has all the logic of how to run applications and how to um, and what it needs when it needs to request for more resources from the cloud itself. Um, this is a an oversimplification, but yeah, it, it's like that. So that's what we call a cluster. It's a group of masters that manage a group of worker nodes. The worker nodes is where the actual application runs. Oh, I see. Uh, what's a container? Container. Um, the container, um, well, what made containers popular was Docker, which is um, it's a technology that uses something that Linux had. Now it's in all popular big operating systems used for servers. But Linux had something called uh, namespaces in, 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 namespaces is only one of the things it had, but it has a few, a few things that can isolate a workload. And essentially, before we had virtual machines, which means you run a whole operating system to serve workload on top of another machine. It's like stacking machines on top of each other. Um, the containers allowed for you to use the same kernel, but the application will think it's in its own machine. And aside from that, you can also limit the access to many of the resources of that base operating system 
for that container, meaning you can give the container the CPU time it can use. You can give the container the memory it can use. You can give the container many limitations. And aside, it will be a self-contained application that you can run wherever you have the capacity to run that type of containers. So the containers became, became popular because of that. And then Kubernetes is an orchestrator of containers. It's not the only technology for orchestrating, but it's the one that became dominant in the, in the market. So um, you can think of um, Kubernetes as, yeah, the orchestra lead who then decides what instrument is going to play where, when, and, and yeah, those kind of tasks. And then the container would be the actual musician doing, doing a type of jobs. Sometimes you need three violins, and sometimes you need five, and sometimes you need 200. So depending on the case, you, you, you add more or reduce. Uh, those are the kind of decisions that uh, Kubernetes makes. And then the scheduler in Kubernetes is uh, the part of software that actually launches the, the different workloads and decides when to stop, when to, when to continue, when to go. Yeah. Well, sounds very uh, complex. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, maybe I, I made it over complicated because I, I couldn't explain it in simpler terms. But um, yeah, the, the container is a type of, um, of software that allows for isolation of a workload and allows for it to also be self-contained in anything that can follow the standard of what a container expects. And then... Um, this allows for solving problems like, well, it runs in my machine. Uh, you, 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 if, it, if you develop it for a container, then wherever that container can run, it will run. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. There are exceptions, but yeah. Well, um, AWS is not free for like, you know, uh, like, uh, individuals, startup founders, no? You know, we we have to go to pay for it, I guess. Yeah, it, you have to pay for AWS. AWS has free tier for people to get started and play around. But you need to understand what you're doing because you can go over the free tier pretty easily and... And, and it's charge spend, a credit card kind of thing. Yeah. And spend uh, money. That uh, Most big clouds have free tier. At the end, I don't think I answered which cloud you should use. But, um, yeah, the decision is, is based on your needs and your capabilities and, and where you are and... Because, for instance, um, China has AWS. Um, it's normally a few years behind the AWS of the rest of the world, but it has AWS. It's kind of small over there. Why? Because it came late to China compared to the older clouds like Aliyun, which is somewhat of a copy of AWS, <laughs> if I can put it bluntly. But um, it, it's been serving customers for many, many years in, in China. Therefore, it's more popular than AWS in China, for instance. Everywhere else in the world, the most popular cloud is AWS, and it's been losing some market sh uh, share lately. Uh, like for instance, Microsoft has been gaining ground with Azure. Um, but what's going to happen and who's going to be dominant in the future is really hard to, to tell because, yeah, they are competitors trying to, to rule the market. The big ones, I think they are here to stay, at least for, for some time, like AWS, uh, uh, Azure, and Google. Um, but each region might have their own particulars. Like, for instance, the, the EU wants to, to have more dominance in EU companies, uh, of course, and they are making laws in, in that direction. If they are going to achieve um, changing the actual outcome of what people use, that's, that's hard to say. Um, but yeah, they will try. <laughs> that was great. Um, I also want to ask you a couple of questions on management, so um, on technology management. So you also lead a number of people, right? Um, which one do you find more enjoyable, the tech stuff or the leading people stuff or, uh, or both? Oh. Um, well, I've, I've led people um, uh, since pretty early in my career, and um, 
I have been in roles that are both hands-on and leading people over, over the years. Um, I like them both. Um, I like to talk to people. I like to coach people. Um, I like to learn from people. Um, during coaching, I tend to learn a lot because uh, when you have a good junior engineer, they will ask questions that you don't know the answer for. The best answer for that is, I have no clue. Let's go figure it out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it, it allows me to think with someone else's brain sometimes, and that helps me learn. And uh, coaching is one of my favorite things. And wherever I go, I, I normally have people that I try to learn from and, and people who um, hopefully learn something from me. But it's kind of a bi-directional uh, relationship. And then <clears throat> the other part is the, the part of actually being a people manager. For instance, right now I'm in a, in a role that is uh, it's not really managing people directly. But um, the roles over the years um, um, have kind of changed. And the companies, how they uh, lead people change. Every company is different, but um, there are uh, companies where, where um, people management is done a certain way. There are companies where it's different. It's good to understand the culture where, where, you, are, where you are working. And aside from that, it's good to be uh, understanding with people who, who you are managing. It's good to, to actually uh, get to know the people very well. You don't have to become friends, friends with everyone, but you have to understand that there's a person on the other side of, of management and you, you, you need to understand also what your company expects, what your team is supposed to do, and also what the people expect themselves. Uh, some people, unfortunately, go to work only to get paid. Um, I go to work to get paid too, but uh, for me it's really important that the work I do is meaningful, that the work I do uh, leads me somewhere, that I'm learning things, that um, I'm working with what we call cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, it's different for, for every person. And then managing people, it's, it's, um, it's juggling with all of those uh, things. There are books you can read to, to learn to manage. I have read a few books about uh, managing people. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, um, it's about understanding uh, dynamics of how teams interact, how cultures create incentives or lack of incentives, and, and how to balance what you need to deliver with uh, the team's well-being and, and the people um, who work for that team. Yeah. I see. Um, these days, right, um, do you still think it's very important for people to get a degree in computer science or giving the information out there, does it not matter? Or? Um, I have a degree in computer sciences. It, it was helpful to me because it, it, it showed me it showed me the theory of things that I would have had a hard time in, in Cuba to actually get to understand them. Uh, but that was 2000 when I started studying, 2002. So, yeah, it's been a while. The world has changed a lot. Nowadays, there's a lot of information in the Internet. You can get uh, training for free almost everywhere. But unfortunately... Um, Laws and regulations and governments have not really moved on from we need the paper. Yeah, so um, it's a personal decision for everyone. You don't really need to, to have a degree to know things nowadays. Um, but having the papers uh, tends to help. If you could have both, the knowledge and the paper, <laughs> that, that's the best. Uh, because of the utility of, of papers. Like, um, 
for instance, I wouldn't have been able to immigrate to different countries if I didn't have the papers. In some of those countries, it's a requirement. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's, it, it's really hard to, to opine for other people. Probably if you live in the developed world and you have the possibility of learning, um, having the paper or not wouldn't really matter much. As long as you can find the right, the right coaching material and people. Yeah? Because that's another, another, another issue that helps a lot. If you find the right coaches, you will spend a lot of less time going around in circles, which is very helpful when you are starting on anything. Um, uh, like, for instance, um, if you are going to learn to program in Python, which is one of the most popular programming languages nowadays, you would probably just go and start reading on Internet, and probably you'll spend a lot of time on things that are not very important. But if you have the right coach, he will tell you, yeah, learn, I don't know, loops, like for loops, learn if, learn data structures, learn functions, learn object-oriented programming. But don't spend much time on this specific library for, I don't know, manipulating images, for instance, if you are not going to work on a project that is about manipulating images or things that will sidetrack you. Manipulating images might be the most important thing in your life, uh, but if you are just learning the programming language, it's probably not your main goal, you see, so. I see, yeah. One last um, question right before we finish, which is, um, so, so I see as a budding computer science engineer, who's going to graduate in the next two years, right? And they're coming in the world of AI, and ChatGPT can do their programming job, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm. What should they do now to, uh, to not be pushed out of the market even before they enter it? Right. Um, well, one of the advices would be learn something about AI. <laughs> um, aside from that, there are, there are fields that are here to stay at least for the next, I don't know, decade, I think. Uh, find what those fields are and, and join those fields if you can, or learn what you can about those fields. And aside from that, um, if you have the opportunity to intern in, in companies that are doing um, things you are interested about, go ahead and do it, because that will give you the vision of what people actually do when they are trying to to achieve things. Maybe when you when you go intern somewhere and you start working with the actual issues you are inter you thought you were interested about, you won't be interested anymore. So it's good to learn early what your interests your interests are and what the market wants and what's going to happen with those wants of the market in the near future and midterm and longer term. So yeah, I think that's the best I can do as of the top of my head. But Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. A tech, the tech world is never uh, easy to uh, fully grasp, but uh, you make it a lot easier. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and for distilling all these uh, concepts and terminologies for us today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.